start. So, first of all, if your exam is being given online, it is following the normal schedule. That means it may not be available early. It may be opening exactly when your professor told you it would open. You are welcome to go check and see if it is accessible to you, but don't be disappointed or surprised if an online exam is not available Friday at 3.30, the way I'm going to explain to you about your main campus exams, okay? So online exams, as scheduled, just normal, do exactly what your professor told you to do. If you are taking a main campus classroom paper exam next week, then you have this option. We will be opening a proctored test center in D105 at 3.30 on Friday afternoon. The first thing that will happen at 3.30 on Friday afternoon is that Mrs. Archibald will be giving the ACT test to those of you that are in Comp 2 and must complete it as part of your requirements for the course. So if you want to do your tests early and you are in Mrs. Archibald's English Comp class, you have to show up at 3.30 for the English Comp exam, okay? We will also be offering any other paper exam that you want to take. You may take those exams from 3.30 in the afternoon until 8 o'clock at night on Friday, or you may take them Saturday morning from 8 to 12, okay? You just show up, say the name of your exam, the proctor will have your exam, they'll give it to you, they'll give you a quiet place to take it, and you can take it early. Nobody has to take your exam early. But just in case you want to do that, we are also moving the study sessions from, Thursday, from Sunday night and Monday night until back to Thursday night and Friday night. So the scheduled study sessions that you may have been planning to participate in will be offered Thursday night and Friday night. Mrs. Archibald will have some information for you on that if you need it. Um, so if you do not want to take your exams early, then exams are going to be offered at the normal schedule, just like the posted schedule that we gave you a long time ago. Professors will be here. They'll be in the class. They'll offer the exam. You can take it. If the snow becomes a reality, <coughs> they'll still be offered. But they may be offered at an altered schedule, OK? So watch for an announcement. Let's say we get 10 inches of snow, but you're in the dorm, and you're in your room, and you can walk across the parking lot, and you want to take your exam. There will be a proctor here to give it to you but they may not give it to you at 12.30, the way the schedule said. They may send you a message that says, the exam room is open from 8 to 12, and then you just come and again, say which exam you wanna take and take it. Does that make sense to everybody? So we'll offer it during the regular exam period, but it may or may not be at the right time. No snow message, it's at the right time. Snow message, watch for dates and times. Final piece of it is this, let's say that it dumps tons of snow, and you didn't take your exams early, what do you do? Once the roads are clear, we'll open the proctored test center again later in the week. So if you live in Greensboro and you can't drive here on Tuesday, we will open the proctored test center as soon as it opens. I'll pretend I'm a weather person and say, hey, it should be open by Thursday at least. You should be able to get back here. So you just have to watch for announcements. It is our goal that no matter which one of these options you choose, and no matter how much snow falls, everybody takes all their exams by the, the 14th, okay? So that's our goal, that's what we're shooting for, and keep that in mind as you work your way through it. Let's see if I forgot anything. So I will follow this announcement up with an email that says what I said in here. I just wanted to be sure I said it to you face to face as well. And I will hang around at the end of chapel in case your particular situation is so unusual, you think you need to ask me a question, all right? Good success, study hard. Those exam grades can make a big difference, so don't get so excited about going home you forget to study. We wanna see some A's, okay? Thank you, Dr. Ashburn. Yeah, thank you so much. If you just came in here late, uh, that was a, probably the most important announcement you're gonna hear this semester. And so uh, that means we're not going to repeat it. You need to be watching your emails um, and uh, make sure that your exams. So just know this. If you are also for the module coming up, if you are registered for that module and there is a big snow this weekend, then you need to be watching for the announcements of when all that's going to take place in case the weather makes it shift as well. But you just know this. There is in no case that you get to go home without taking an exam. And so you are responsible, regardless of the weather, uh, for 
your exams, all right? Hey, tomorrow, remember, it's a little weird tomorrow. We're going to be in chapel in here, Dean's Chapel, so we can just uh, talk about how we end the semester well, the move-outs and changing rooms and things like that. So tomorrow's chapel will be in here, Dean's Chapel. Uh, Friday, 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., JV and Varsity Women's Basketball, respectively. Saturday, 5.30 and 7.30, JV and Varsity Men's Basketball, respectively. And so uh, come and cheer on your team if you're still around and you haven't taken your exams early and gotten out of town, all right? And then uh, this is important, too. I'm going to be sending an, an email out as well. Uh, Christian service hours for this semester. Uh, as you know, we didn't get the Blackboard thing just because we have so many things going on with our Genza bar and student SIS and all that kind of stuff. We didn't get the Blackboard shell out to you, so here's how we're going to do it. We're going to make it easy on you. You just send me the log of your Christian service hours by email. I will send you an email, so be watching for that, and then you just send me your Christian service hours log so we can have it all taken care of uh, for this semester. Next semester, we'll get back to doing it uh, through Blackboard. All right? So you'll see an email from me for that. All right? Well, it's President's Chapel today, so I'm looking forward to hearing from our president, and our band's going to set things up. So why don't we stand to your feet? Let me remind our, our students that we sit in the front four rows. So those of you back there, come on up. And that's where we sit in chapel. We should have that down by now. It's December, and we've been saying that since August. All right. Let's stand to our feet, please. And we are going to get our worship on this morning. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you love us so much and that you are so, so good. And, Father, we thank you that you've given us the voice and the freedom to worship in this place. So I pray that you just, just move in us today as we glorify you and put you at the center of our world as you've asked us to do so. So bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who made just greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our This, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels see. Haste, haste to bring him God, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh, come peasant king to the Son of Mary. Mary, this, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring Him, Lord, the babe, the Son of Mary. shall pierce him through the cross he bore for me for you hail hail the word made flesh the babe the son of Mary let's pray dear Lord we just want to thank you thank you for your love, your overflowing love, abounding love. You sent your son to die for us, to be born as a human, to live a perfect life, even though we didn't deserve it. We did nothing to earn it. We turned our backs on you, ran away from you time and time again. You knew we would continue to do this, but you still loved it enough to send your son. I just want to thank you for this. Pray for uh, Dr. Pettit as he comes and speaks today. You will just uh, give him the words to say and that we may be attentive and listening. And I pray, amen. All right, nicely done, tough song, great message. It actually tells both sides of that story, the birth of Christ, but also points to the reason for the birth and, of course, the reason for really all that we are and all that we do. In the fullness of time, at that perfect moment in history, Christ stepped into this world, became man, became flesh, and actually fulfilled so many things, all those Old Testament types that pointed to him, all those prophecies that pointed to him, the need of the entire world, our sins, our guilt, all pointing to that need. And in the fullness of time, Christ came. And he was born. We will celebrate that in many ways over these next couple of weeks. But he was born to die. To die for you, to die for me, to die in my place. To pay the price that I deserve to pay because of my own sin and mankind's rebellion against God. He paid the penalty. He paid the price. And as a result, we can sing about it and we can shout our hallelujahs and celebrate this season. Well, I don't, know, I, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to believe that we're already here to the end of this semester. And uh, I don't know, I felt like it kind of flew by. How many of you think, thought it was like agonizingly slow? It took forever to get through the semester. All right, how many think it just flew by? All right, how many of you are not going to raise your hands no matter what I ask? All right. <laughs> this can be a tough group right here sometimes. Well, it's uh, just snow and exams left. Uh, and uh, this is one of those times where it seems like those predictions might be right. You know, in North Carolina, they never seem to get it right. If they predict a lot, you get nothing. If they predict nothing, you get a lot. But they've been talking about this a lot going forward. They've been talking about it a long time, and they seem to have a handle on the fact that we're going to get something pretty significant. So be prepared, be ready, study fast, take exams soon. 
I'm glad that's you and not me, that's for sure. All right. And uh, I knew I had been gone too long from Piedmont and had traveled too much this semester when I ended up having to talk to you using an Apple camera from a hotel room in Missouri. So sorry about that, but it is good to be back. And I want to talk to you a little bit from the Bible. So grab your Bible and open it to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to just talk about ministry for a few minutes. Uh, Piedmont really has always existed to train people to use their lives in a way that count for eternity. And it doesn't really matter if you graduate from here and you are, are in business or you're a teacher in a private or a public school or if you're an athlete, or you're a pastor, or you're a missionary, we hope that everybody who graduates from here has a bigger purpose than down here, than this earth, and that you'll use your lives in ways that count, that matter for eternity, and that you will share the knowledge of God everywhere you go with everyone you can. And I hope that's true of everyone. But it's interesting that Jesus said that we should pray specifically for laborers into the harvest fields, and he was talking about praying that God would send people who would go out to proclaim the gospel. That they would take the gospel, that they would be in ministry in that capacity, not just adding ministry to their lives, which every Christian should do. Uh, you, no one needs a calling from God to do ministry. All you need to do is be a believer, and you should do ministry. That just goes with the territory. But we are to pray to God that he would send laborers, servants of the Lord into ministry. And he calls people like that from all different walks of life. We have a lot of athletes at Piedmont. God has used athletes in great ways uh, and sometimes as the platform being their athletic platform. But a lot of times he calls people from that and into the ministry. Uh, Billy Sunday was a great baseball player, professional baseball player, and uh, was well known for his career. But God called him into the ministry and just because he had a little celebrity and a little fame, people would come out to hear him, but not just hear him, but watch him. Uh, he would run across the platform and slide, like sliding into second base, and he would talk about people trying to slide into heaven. He, he actually used his skills and athleticism and kept people's attention, but really felt that God was calling him into the ministry. So I try to honor that command of our Lord. Jesus said, here's one of the things, actually Jesus did not give us many things to pray specifically. He wants us to pray with our intelligence, to pray about things that are going on. But he did tell us to specifically pray that he would send laborers, people into the ministry, people who we called to go into ministry as pastors, uh, as missionaries, in some kind of a capacity where their life is all about ministry. And so I, I try to do that every day. I try to ask God that he would just send laborers. And I ask God that he would use this place, Piedmont, and our network as a giant launching pad of laborers into the harvest fields. And so uh, I'm going to put a little feet to my prayers today and just talk to you for a few minutes about that. Um, and also talk to you about the reality that, yes, everybody in this world faces challenges, right? It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, if you go into a career, you're going to have challenges. If you just live life, you're going to have challenges. But if you go into the ministry and you serve Christ with your life, you're going to have problems as well. Everybody has them. In 2 Corinthians 11, you see that the Apostle Paul, a man greatly used of God in ministry, had his share, maybe more than his share, of challenges and problems and headaches. And so he says in 2 Corinthians 11, if you look down around verse 23, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths more often. He had endless close calls with death. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one, so some beatings. And then he ex expounds on that. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness. He must have had final exam somewhere along the way. Uh, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, 
Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. I must boast. I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Eretus the king was guarding the city of Damascus or Damascenes with a garrison desiring to arrest me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. So a couple of challenges and problems he faced in ministry. Let's pray and talk about this a bit. Father, thank you for bringing us through this semester. And now that we have reached this point where we have uh, the students here have uh, final exams and different projects to finish and other issues that they face, we ask that you give them grace and strength and discipline. And I pray that they would accomplish the ending of this semester well. They would give it their best and you would help them through this and help us as we get through this in this weather predicament. And we ask for your safety and blessings and all of that. Help us to understand um, your word, understand what you have for us. And I want to ask again that you, the Lord of the harvest, would cast out laborers into your harvest and that you do it from right here in large numbers. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The United States Navy has a number of slogans. Over the years, they keep adopting new ones. I think the last time I saw an ad, it said, Forged by the Sea, if I remember correctly. My favorite from when I was a bit younger was, It's not just a job, it's an adventure. Join the Navy. Um, I think that would be a good slogan for life lived in service to Christ and life lived in ministry. I actually had no idea uh, when I yielded myself to Christ and I said yes to the Lord, I, I want to serve you, I want to give my life to you, and I want to serve you in ministry. And I will go in, to a school like this, and I will study, and I will prepare, and I will serve you in the ministry. I had no idea when I went all in for Christ uh, that I would have these kinds of experiences. Not like Paul, but like we'll talk about in a minute. I just wanted to serve Christ. I, I was wrestling. Am I going to go my way, pursue my things? Or am I going to go all in for Christ and give myself entirely to him? I really didn't want to be in the middle. I didn't want to sort of be a halfway Christian. I either wanted to go all in or, or forget it. But when God directed me toward making a difference with my life and wanting my life to count, I discovered that serving Christ can become the ultimate adventure. And being all in is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to do what Paul talks about doing. A lot of folks long for adventure. Many of us in this room, we love a surge of adrenaline that comes from taking risk or the fear that comes when facing danger. We even have a holiday that features fear. You know, Halloween gives us a hint of danger. Many of us want to watch those horror movies. We want to feel that little hint of being afraid. And uh, we sometimes will read the books, watch the movies, and we want that sense of adventure. We want to liven up what might be otherwise boring lives. Uh, we have people who are thrill seekers, who satisfy their lust for adventure and their desire to feel that death-defying, uh, fear-infusing sense of adrenaline by what? Skydiving or base jumping or bungee jumping or we go to some amusement park and we try to ride the biggest, baddest, newest roller coaster because it gives us that sense of fear and that catching of our breath and that surge of adrenaline. Maybe it's rock climbing. Uh, maybe it's like debating Dr. Hollinger in theology, something like that. Um, I think a lot of us kind of like that. We like that surge of adrenaline. I sometimes feel like I'm, I'm a junkie a little bit. I enjoy a little energy and excitement. I like riding a, a fast motorcycle on a curvy road. Uh, you're just hoping you don't come around the curve and find a patch of gravel there. Uh, and they, they say there are two kinds of motorcycle riders those who have been down and those who will be down. And I still remember very vividly the day I went from one category to the other, not something I really enjoyed. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my trip down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon on a nine day rafting tour. Uh, you get to go through some of the only class 10 rapids in America that you're allowed to, to go through legally anyway on a raft. And it was terrifying, 
you weren't sure you're going to live when you see that raging waterfall and when some of the rapids are actually named falls you're going through lava falls uh, it's, it's terrifying, but it's also exhilarating and exciting. And as you're going through that, you're just hoping you're going to not fall off. You're hoping you're going to survive. But when you're through it and you've done it, it's like, yes, we did it. There was that, that excitement. Uh, we recently, my family, we recently hiked trails in Olympic National Park. And I remember us walking on some paths that went along ledges that had several hundred feet down if you had a misstep. And it was scary, but at the same time, it was kind of fun and exciting. We walked the uh, Capilano Swinging Bridge near Vancouver, this high swinging bridge way over a river below, pretty safe, but it still gave you that little surge of adrenaline. And if we aren't able to experience actual danger, then we th seek that thrill virtually. We play those video games and movies we watch that give us a bit of a hint of danger. And my daughter has shown me some of those sort of scary video games where you walk, you're walking through the house and things jump out at you. I don't really like that per personally. She thinks it's kind of fun. Well, the Apostle Paul was not a thrill seeker. That was not his goal. He did not go all in because he had some lust for adventure. He went all in because of God and what happened on the Damascus Road and coming to know Christ as a Savior and wanted to give his life for the Lord. But I can tell you that he did not need a ticket to Carowinds or a whitewater adventure trip or a Netflix subscription or the latest movie to have a feeling of adventure. He lived it. His life reads like a blockbuster movie. Uh, I, I feel like the Apostle Paul was kind of the real Indiana Jones. That's actually long before your time, right? Anybody know who Indiana Jones was? Oh, I feel so good. Uh, you know, he's sort of that guy who uh, is the archaeology professor. He's just kind of a big brain guy who sits in the classroom and, uh, and teaches people things. But we know that that is interspersed with his crazy, death-defying adventures that come into his life. And we often think of the Apostle Paul as that amazing scholar. You come to Piedmont, you study the New Testament, you study Pauline epistles, you basically study the Bible... And you're going to get a lot of theology from the pen of the Apostle Paul. And you're going to study a lot about what he wrote because he was a scholar. Some have said that his education at the feet of Gamaliel was the equivalent of a double PhD. He paid the price to get the knowledge in here. And that alone wasn't what he needed. What he really needed was to be yielded to Christ. And when that happened, that combination of that amazing brain, that amazing education, and being all in for Christ gave him the platform that God would use him as the person who bring all of these amazing revelations to us about the age in which we now live, about the truth that we need to assimilate into our lives, and all about justification and grace. Uh, fantastic. So that's the Apostle Paul I often think about. But that is just part of the story. That's the Indiana Jones writing on the chalkboard part of the story. But the Apostle Paul's life was absolutely full of close calls, brushes with death, crazy challenges. If you're Paul, it just goes with the territory. It's just part of being the Apostle Paul. We read earlier, I mean, the governor of Damascus attempted to have him killed. He has a narrow escape. He escapes out of a window. They let him down with a rope out of the window so that he won't be murdered. He once survived a raging hurricane in a wooden sailing ship. He was once bitten by a deadly venomous snake. And from the text that we've been reading and from other passages, thrown in prison several times, whipped several times, stoned, shipwrecked. You know, some people just crave that feeling of danger. We just want it. For Paul, it was just part of the job description. In his list, he mentioned danger from robbers, danger from Jews, Gentiles, Danger in the cities, danger out of the cities, danger in the deserts, danger on the seas, danger from men who claimed to be believers, but they were liars, they were false believers. You know, everybody has problems, right? Everybody has problems. Everybody in this room, we all have problems. And as you live life, you just get those normal, run-of-the-mill problems. The pipe breaks, and you have to call the plumber. Your toothache comes, yeah, you got to go to the dentist. Bills add up can't quite pay them, have family squabbles, uh, the neighbors start gossiping. Everybody has problems. Car breaks down, your roommate's a jerk. Everybody has a problem or two in life, right? 
It's just part of living. But I have discovered that there are no problems quite like serving Christ problems, kind of like ministry problems. Uh, they kind of come, come into a category all of their own. If you hang around people who've served Christ for life and they just start sharing their stories, I always love them because they aren't just the pipe broke. In my case, I'm thinking about pipes. So the first time I sort of plunged into ministry, I was in Atlanta and we had an opportunity to start a multicultural, multiracial church in Atlanta. I was 22 years old. I had lots of zeal and uh, very little brains, but I, I was excited about it. So I recruited some college students about the age of most of you, and we went into this thing together. We were going to start a church. We went, we went out, and this was back when we didn't know any better than just to go around and knock on doors. And somebody come to the door, hi, we're starting a church. Can we talk to you about Jesus? Goodbye. Psh. <laughs> it wasn't probably the best method on the planet, except it actually kind of worked. You know, the truth is, if you'll share the gospel in whichever way you want to share it, talk to your relatives when you go home for Christmas, talk to your old schoolmates, talk to total strangers, you always get the same three responses. You get the same three responses that the Apostle Paul got on Mars Hill. Some mocked. That's crazy. Others said, oh, that's interesting. I, I, I need to talk about that some more. And some believed. That's pretty much the response you always get. If you become a witness for Christ, you're always going to get those three things. Some people think you're, think you're crazy, a Jesus freak. Some are going to say, oh, let me think about that. I might, I might consider that. And some are actually going to come to Christ. Well, that's what we experience. We experience the people coming to Christ. People of all ages, people of all races coming to Christ. And so we, in, in just a short time, in this building that we've been given access to, which had been a church, we, uh, we need a baptism. Well, the church had a baptistry just like that. And I was excited. I was in a church that had been provided for me free. All I had to do was pay utilities. I had a group of about 20 people that needed to be baptized. And so I went in. We were going to baptize on a Sunday morning, and it was January. It was about this kind of weather. And thankfully, the baptistry had a heater. But they didn't teach me over in my how to do church courses that you're supposed to run the water in before you turn the heater on. There is this little element. The water has to be over the element before you turn the heater on. I didn't know that. I just went in and turned the heater on. I could feel it was getting hot. Great. Turned the water on, filled it up. Did not realize I had burned out the element. Sunday morning came and that water was like if you were over there in Lee Hall right now, you turned on the cold. It felt about like that. I was wearing waders under my suit. And so I wasn't actually touching the water, but as soon as I got in it, I felt really cold. That first person, that toe went in the water. <gasps> everybody in the church heard, everybody laughed. And we baptized 20 people. Then we were like praying over people for the flu and stuff like that after that. But you just don't know, you know, you get into ministry and you get the normal problems, but you also get, start getting different problems. I still remember going to Zambia the first time. I don't know if you know or not, but we have a relationship with a college in Zambia and we provide master's level training for them. And it's not unusual at one of our graduations that there are several people who graduated in the heart of Africa from our program. But I remember going over there for the first time. I was invited to some key leader's home. I was the guest of honor. And I remember going in there, and uh, this was exciting. And they said that, uh, that, that they were going to serve me the delicacy reserved for special guests. And they brought out stewed caterpillars. These are like big worms in blood when you looked in the bowl, big red stuff. And so then you like get your hand, you, you grab this stuff and you make a ball of this doughy like substance and you dip it in there and get some tomato sauce on it and you grab a caterpillar and you eat it. And as the guest of honor, you had to do it. You, know, you, you get the normal problems, but you also get these uh, really strange problems. I, I think I've told this story, but it's probably been years since I told it here. And I know funerals aren't supposed to be funny. They aren't supposed to be funny, but this one actually ended up being pretty hilarious. So uh, I was in the West Indies for 10 years and we were planting churches there. And we had a lady named Mrs. Patterson. She was 99 years old when she passed away. And so we had Mrs. Patterson's funeral. Now, it was a third world country, very primitive. And uh, we were going to have the graveside service in the very rough cemetery on the side of the steep mountain. And it was rainy season. It had been raining for months, so there was really tall grass. The family hired somebody to go in with machetes and chop down the grass, make a clearing. And then they hired some grave diggers to come in and dig a grave. And the way this was supposed to work, I had seen some of these, so I thought I knew how to do this. Basically, you have a funeral procession, everybody walks in the cemetery, everybody gathers around the grave that's been dug, and there's like a couple of two-by-fours laid over the grave. And they set the casket on top of the two-by-fours, 
And once everybody's in place, the preacher gives the nod and they lower the casket to the bottom. And then you do dust to dust, ashes to ashes, preach a little sermon, sing some songs. And while you're singing the songs, they actually fill the grave in. And when it's all filled in and has a nice mound on top, you put flowers on top, sing a special song and go home. That's the way it's supposed to happen. But no one told me that it was the preacher's job to measure the grave to make sure it was long enough and wide enough to match the coffin because all these coffins were homemade. And so no two of them were the same size. I started getting nervous as soon as I watched them put that casket down on those two two by fours. Because I thought to myself, that hole looks long enough, but I'm not sure if that hole looks wide enough. And uh, I seemed to be the only one noticing it, and I was nervous. Well, finally the crowd came into the clearing and I gave the nod to the guys to lower. So they picked that casket up with ropes from both sides, pulled the two befores out from under, and they started lowering it. To my relief, it started going down. It was touching on both sides, but it was starting to go down into the hole. But then I noticed that the casket had been built with a cover, a two-piece cover, and there was like a two-inch lip that went all the way around the outside of the casket. And I thought, I'm not sure that lid is going to go down in there. Well, sure enough, when it got down to ground level, it just kind of stuck. And by this time, I could see on all the faces that everybody was as nervous as me. This is a country where they love slapstick humor. You know, don't tell a joke like we heard this morning that has some kind of a punchline or a play on words or sarcasm. If you want to make Vincentians laugh, just fall down and break your leg in three places. They'll laugh for a long, long time. And so I could already see that they were starting to get, first of all, concerned, but they were also starting to choke back their laughter. And so they, they, these guys like jiggled this thing a couple of times. They were just trying to get it to go down and it wasn't going. So they like lifted it up and just kind of dropped it. And it worked. It went all the way to the bottom as the lid flew open. Yeah, or at least the bottom half of it. And we're all looking at a 99-year-old pair of legs at the bottom of a, cat, of a grave. So her 54-year-old son climbs down into the casket and tries to fix mom's dress and tries to close the casket. It's like stuck in mud. He's down there like clawing at the mud to like close the lid. Finally, he gets the lid pretty much closed, but it's like about four inches from being really closed. So he gets on top of it and just starts jumping up and down on top of the casket. That's not working. So another guy jumps down there. The two of them are jumping up and down on top of the casket. I finally said, okay, guys, I think that's good enough. Climb on out. So uh, then it was time for me to do dust to dust, ashes to ashes. I reached down to pick up some dust, but it was rainy season. There was no dust in several countries, only mud. So I thought, well, I'll just sprinkle some mud. So I picked up a clump of mud. I went over to the end that had not yet been destroyed of the casket. And I held it out and I looked around and I said, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. I went to sprinkle it. Then I realized I picked up a big rock that was covered with mud. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll just drop that. I let it go. It hit with far more authority than I would have thought possible. Boom! Well, now everybody is laughing. <laughs> They're trying to cry, but they can't help but laugh. So now I preached my little sermon, and we started singing our hymns, and they started burying, you know, putting the, the grave dirt back in there. But the problem was they hired two guys, and they were both drunk. These guys really didn't know which end of the shovel they were supposed to. They're like leaning on the shovel, and like one shovel full. Then they're trying to sing, which was not working. And they like, it's taking all afternoon, we're singing and very slowly shoveling. We're singing and very slowly shoveling. It starts getting dark. And uh, James Jackson, who was my associate pastor at the time, uh, I really maintained my composure up until this moment, but he was on the other side. He looked at me, he had the one hymn book and we're singing all these hymns, Amazing Grace and How Great Thou Art. He looked at me with this little look on his face and he said, all right, everybody, let's lift up our voices and sing together. Work for the night is coming. And so we did. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you get all the normal problems, but if you serve Christ, you get interesting problems. I actually have a whole list here, but it's 1130. I'm hungry. You have like snow and exams coming. So I'm going to move quickly to the end. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to say that a life serving Christ and in ministry is not just a bunch of problems. For Paul, it was not all pain and suffering. His life was lived all in for Christ. It was a life that was exciting. It was abundant. It was adventurous. I do think Paul probably attended the original Olympic Games, or at least he was extremely aware of them, because if you read Paul's writings, he's always talking about wrestling and boxing and track, running to, to win a prize. He traveled broadly from the Middle East all the way to Europe and all points in between. 
You know, I never dreamed when I said an eternal yes to Christ, I want to serve you with my life. It doesn't matter to me what that is. I just want to serve you with my life. I never dreamed that I would enjoy some of the things that God has allowed me to enjoy. Living in the West Indies, learning to play cricket. That's a great sport right there. Uh, spear fishing every week. I would have never dreamed that I would travel to China, Japan, Egypt, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, England, France, Bangladesh, India, and about 20 more countries. That I would have a chance to preach on every inhabited continent except Australia. I have to still get there. Um, Paul had a fulfilling life, a life that really made a difference on earth and had an impact on eternity. He ministered in the major metropolis centers of the day. He ministered in tiny fishing villages. He preached in tiny little Jewish synagogues. At other times, he stood up on Mars Hill and preached to the most influential philosophers of the world. He preached to politicians, governors, and even kings in his ministry. And he was able to use his talents, his love of sports, his education, his skills, his personality, and his background for God. I don't think Paul would have ever guessed back when he was getting a classical education, studying all those subjects. Sometimes you come to a school like Pima, like, why do I have to take that class? <laughs> That's never going to help me. He would have never dreamed when he was going through that, becoming a scholar, that years later, for a totally different purpose, he would become the best-selling author of world history. Those books that Paul wrote have sold more than any other books in the history of the world. So, if you are sensing in your life a growing desire to give your life to God for ministry, if you decide to go all in for the gospel, get ready for challenges, obstacles, problems, danger, pain, but also get ready for amazing opportunities, unlike anything else you have ever experienced. And most likely, get ready for some adventure as well. Uh, more than the thrill of danger and adventure, that amazing feeling. I remember doing this so many times during our years in the West Indies, waking up thinking, nobody back home knows who I am, where I am, um, doesn't matter. I'm not going to make a splash on this planet, but this is making a difference. These people are coming to Christ. This is counting for eternity. There's something beautiful and amazing about a life given entirely to Christ and used for him and for his glory. Well, I had a long list of people that God allowed me to come into contact with. But uh, like I said earlier, I think I'm running out of time. Get ready to be surprised. We'll conclude with this. Get ready to be surprised by the level of impact one person can have who goes all in. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is saying, sincerely all in. You might feel unworthy, weak, insignificant, maybe even like you're just a compilation of failures. But if you go all in, God will use you in ways unimaginable. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this group that's here. Um, all kinds of different backgrounds, different skills, different things that are important to us, different things that make us tick, that energize us and excite us, different personalities, different loves. But I pray that the greatest love would be of Christ. We sing these songs at Christmas. If there was ever anyone who was all in, it was your son, enjoying the beauty and splendor of heaven and came to a world filled with problems that he would experience personally at every level. Give himself, do the will of the Father, endure the pains, the challenges, 
the headaches, <laughs> but also a joy that he speaks about in Hebrews 12, a joy set before him when it's all said and done, a life given to his father, a life given for others, a life that made an amazing difference and certainly has counted in all of our lives. I pray that you'd call students from Piedmont into your direct ministry. Lord, I thank you for every student, for every person that graduates from here that teaches in a public school, that will run a business, play at a higher level of athletics. I thank you for all of them. Help them to all use that time in their lives for you and for your ministry and to impact others. But I do pray that from this group, you would cast out labors directly into gospel harvest. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a great Christmas.